Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining this PFL workshop brought to you this evening by Astral Aviation Consulting on behalf of the UK Civil Aviation Authority. Uh, if you want to stay in the loop with events and resources, please sign up to our mailing list. And you can do this by going to our website, www.astralaviationconsulting.com, or use the link that's going to appear in the chat box. Uh, and this signing up via this also gives you access to the replay of this workshop and a whole host of other safety resources as well. Uh, as many of you know, uh, my name is Matt Lane. Uh, I'm a head of training in an active single and multi uh, FI and examiner uh, here in West Oxfordshire. Quite a nice night tonight of A400Ms going around my house. Um, so uh, I'm also delighted as ever to be joined by Nigel Wilson. Nigel's a head of training. Uh, a very active FI and flight examiner, display pilot, and many of you will know as well, he also runs the Easy PPL Ground School, which provides a whole host of online courses for pilots, students, instructors, and training organizations as well. Over the next 90 minutes, we're going to break the workshop down into some easily digestible chunks, and we're going to cover some PFL principles, some standard basic PFLs, some alternative PFL procedures, and Nigel's going to give us some PFL top tips for the skills test or proficiency checks if you're doing those as well, which will be really interesting to hear about there as well. And finally, there's going to be time for questions at the end. We will finish at nine o'clock uh, on the dot, um, but we'll try our very best to get through all of the questions. Sporting me in the background is Talitha as well. So she'll be running the tech support and the chat and the Q&A there as well. I could see lots of people already saying hello from all over the UK and even further to see on the chat as well. So it's great to see that as well. And if you ask, uh, you know, contribute through the chat, which would be great. We'd love to see that and we'll try and pick it up as we go through. And equally through the Q&A, we'll try and pick those up at the end appropriately and try and get a good selection of questions to take us through. But to kick us off, I would like to find out if any of you are affiliated to any flying organization. And this is so we can make sure our links with organizations and individuals are maintained to make sure you get all the very best and most up-to-date safety information. So first poll, it should have just be popping up on your screen. If you're affiliated to a local flying club, let us know which one. So local flying club, a larger organization, maybe both of those, or perhaps none at all. I'll just give you a minute to do that. And it also, for those of you that may have not joined us before, um, it gives us uh, you a chance to just try out the poll software and have a look. So, Talitha, if we can have a look at the results on that one, please. Great. So quite a few of you, members of your local flying clubs, both, or... Um, other organizations as well. So we've got a real good spread of representation from the bodies and involvement in various organizations as well. And some of you, it's great um, that you're able to join us. If you're not a member of those as well, we're well aware and we get a lot of feedback from people uh, that are maybe in remote parts of the UK and don't have uh, the opportunity or access to get to events. So it's absolutely brilliant that you can join us online uh, tonight there as well. So great to have you with us as well. So, uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of context about some of the principles of PFLs. And before we get into the detail on this section, as you'll get to know now, we always start each section with a poll. So we've got another poll just to get you thinking here as well. So first question, we'll put this poll up. Approximately how far do you think a typical PA-28 Warrior, typical training school aircraft, will glide from 3,000 foot in still wind? That's 3,000 foot over the ground, above the ground, still wind. So choices, four nautical miles, five nautical miles, seven nautical miles, or two nautical miles. Just have a, have a think. There's a spread of answers there, nothing too outlandish. But choose from four, five, seven, or two. And I will give you the correct answer. Uh, is actually B, about five nautical miles. The char actually comes out about 5.4 nautical miles in still wind, but that's at max weight 
with a propeller windmilling and flown at best glide speed. So there you go, people, four to five nautical miles. People are a fairly good guesstimate there. But it's just worth something thinking about because it gives you an idea. If you think your typical ATZ radius is two nautical miles, gives you a bit of a sort of rough thinking guide in the air as to how far you would um, would would uh, be able to glide in your, the, one of those type of aircraft there as well. So great. Glad to see. Now, forced landings without power is strictly the correct terminology, but generically, we normally refer to the procedure as PFL for practice forced landing. And uh, the requirement to fly an actual forced landing because of engine failure, hopefully, is pretty unlikely. But there's always the possibility of engine problems leading to a reduction in the available engine power. And you should regularly practice these procedures in order to try and hopefully, if it ever happens to you, have a safe landing. Now, you'll probably remember, those of you that have already done it and at that stage, you've before you flew your first solo, you became proficient at the glide circuit and the glide landing. And this was sufficient for you to be able to handle an engine failure in the circuit. Now, because normally, generally, you want to operate away from the airfield, we then must build on that to be able to confidently fly a PFL so that you're prepared to cope with an engine failure whenever and whenever it may care. Now, following an engine malfunction in flight, the pilot's got a lot of factors to consider before deciding on the best course of action to be taken. And here we go, these are some of them there. So the nature of the engine malfunction, its cause, and possibly what we could do to sort it out. The aircraft's position and height above the ground at the time of the emergency. Weather conditions, especially the wind and the type of terrain over which the aircraft's flying, and also light and visibility conditions as well. So tonight, we're going to try and discuss varying scenarios and methods to cope with all of those, or some of those influences that you can see in the boxes there as well. But we also really value real life experiences as well. So let us know as you go through in the chat box, if, have you ever had a forced landing? Have you ever had to do this for real? And uh, you know, in, in kind of, headline terms, uh, you know, what happened, what was the outcome? And if there's some of those real life experiences that come out as we go through, I think that'll be really valuable for everybody. Um, I've only had one actual real full on engine failure and force landing. How many of you had, Nigel? If I move myself, uh, I've not had an actual engine failure. I've had a partial part, but we're going to mention that a bit later on. There we go. So one real uh, and uh, one one partial. So we'll see what comes out in the chat, what other people have had there as well. So why would we have to make a forced landing? Well, the main reason is, as we've already alluded to, our engines failed in some way. Now, some of you will have seen this slide before because we have used it in quite a few of our other workshops. So I'm just going to quickly recap it in case you're new to us. I think it's helpful to think about engine malfunctions. And you're thinking, Matt, what are you going on about? What on earth is a malfunction? It's just an engine failure. You're trying to be clever here as well. Well, this is my suggestion of how you can consider an engine problem. And it may help you to think about it. If you're an engineer by background or training like me, I like kind of fault trees and, and wiring diagrams and things like that as well. But is it a mechanical failure, a non-mechanical failure, or a fire? What are the symptoms that you're seeing? What are the signs of the engine malfunction? Well, why is this important? It might help channel your thinking and your responses. And it might make handling a forced landing a little bit different, as Nigel's going to come on to talk about in some of the techniques uh, that you can use to deal with this as well. I'd also like to highlight here as well, particularly important is the non-mechanical failure case, because this is what could um, result in a partial power loss. And it's a very topical issue. Um, it's come up in some of the current CAA consultations as well, you may see as well. And we are definitely going to return to, uh, to cover uh, that in the, uh, the workshop as well. Now, field selection. The best place to land on is clearly an airfield. But if one's not within range, another suitable landing site must be sought. Now, landing areas are likely to be in range if you appear in an imaginary arc drawn from wingtip to engine cowling. Think about that PA28 question uh, we did earlier as well. Now, these are some of the things you need to consider if you're having to conduct a forced landing in the field. Wind direction, you want to get into the wind. Size, the bigger the better. And one method of assessing the length of the field is again to compare that field side 
to a runway of what you know at base you could normally take off and land it. Surroundings, we're wanting to avoid power lines and other obstructions. And the shape. The square gives the best range of touchdown options. But, you know, runway shaped is, is obviously ideal as well. Surface is is, a, is quite a big influence here as well. Um, grass is one of the better surfaces. Ploughed fields or crops are less desirable since they may flip the aircraft. And colour may also give some guide to the type of surface. And dark brown may signify a ploughed field. Light brown could be ripening crops or stubble. Be very, very um, dependent on the time of year as well. You know, when you get into summer, you can see the, the, the bright yellow of mustard or ale rapeseed crops as well. And choosing a suitable surface will be something that you will want to build experience and practice on because it is not, it's not necessarily that instinctive to us. And slope as well. We want to avoid significant slopes. The landing run will be shorter uphill and downhill will make the flare to touch down more difficult and could even give you a, a float there as well. Um, now, I've already had some input on some of the socials as well. Some people say that they, they teach or have been taught a sixth one, which is stock. So is the um, is there sheep or um, cows or whatever in the field? And do you want to avoid that as well um personally I, I teach that included in the surface um you know conditions there as well but stock if you want to use that as a sick fest is, is another really good uh, uh one to, to think about as well now some of these factors are often difficult to assess clearly from the air particularly when you're at higher levels um you know shape and size can nearly always be seen but the true nature of the surface and the surrounds including obstacles can often only be seen from down on the lower levels. And the slope is, is very uh, unlikely to be evident until the last moments. So it can really catch you out. Um, it's all one of the things I would say about all of this with your field selection as well, it's always acceptable to change the approach to a more suitable field if it's within range and it can be reached safely from the pattern that you're flying there. So don't don't worry about um you know changing your field that that's fine but you must guard against indecision it's easy to change your chosen field too many times and end up with an unplanned and sometimes rushed arrival in the field at the last minute so yeah keeping your options open being flexible is good but don't let that creep into indecision would be would be our advice and nigel i know will reinforce that in the top tips now, I just want to mention here as well, precautionary landings, because sometimes people do get a little bit uh, confused here as well. But precautionary landing is one that you make with power in anticipation of a real emergency. So force landings are non-working, a malfunctioning engine, uh, and a ditching is a forced landing in, in water, remember, as well. Precautionary landing is we, we, it's far more controlled, uh, premeditated uh, event. Um, why do we do this? Well, why do we want to do it early? Why do we do it as a precautionary measure? Well, you can use power to reach a landing site beyond your gliding distance or to compensate for errors in judgment. And if a problem is developing, it's wise to expedite a precautionary landing because delaying it could result in an actual forced landing. So, you know, precautionary landings could also be due to non-technical factors such as weather, light, illness, incapacitation, uh, I know somebody that had to do a precautionary landing only a couple of years ago when a totally unforecast snowstorm enveloped them and they'd made a really good decision to get on and make a precautionary landing and uh, they're safe and the aircraft's all good and everything because of that good decision. We don't have time tonight to go into detail, teach on precautionary landings, um, but suffice to say, as time may not be as critical as the forced landing situation, the precautionary landing may involve a number of passes to inspect the field and you may have more time to develop your field selection. But the criteria for selecting a field is going to be very similar. So there's a lot we can take away from it. But you may have remember this from your PPL skills test doing, you know, a high pass and then a lower pass and then a final approach and giving you time to, to sort that out. So don't forget about forced uh, precautionary landings. It's a really useful thing to have in your toolbox. And finally, alternative landing areas. Um, inhospitable terrain, you know, we're talking things like water, steep hills, moorlands, forests, built up areas. Um, 
you know, some areas of the UK fields are particularly small. Northern Ireland, Cornwall, Wales can have areas where there's lots of fields, but they're all really quite small. Uh, and if you're having to land into an hospitable train, what we recommend is approach at the correct glide speed, because to go below this, you may reduce the rate of descent, but it's also in going to increase the risk of a stall. And you want to be at the correct threshold speed to allow positive control for the landing flare. You want to try and touch down on the main wheels at as slow a speed as possible, but don't hold it off if obstacles appear ahead. Uh, and we want to try and keep the weight off the nose wheel by holding back pressure, but avoiding bouncing back into the air. And if a hazard appears ahead in the landing run, try to steer away. And if an object such as a stone wall cannot be avoided, still try to steer away to allow some other part of the airframe to absorb the impact rather than the very solid engine. So it's almost like trying to, to, to hit at, at an angle there as well. But I mean, really, you're just trying to make keep control of the aircraft and make the best of the situation you've got if you're in one of these particular scenarios. Um, I remember practicing practice force landings in the, in the areas of the Peak District as well. And it was it was remarkably, remarkably hard work to get something good. Um, ditching, we don't have uh, lots of time uh, to go into ditching because it is a very specific um, subject area. Um, there is a brilliant new CAA safety sense leaflet on ditching. Talif is going to put the link in the chat box to us. And um, that, that is really where if you fly in or around water, we're just interested in it. Uh, that's that's really good. Um, I don't know if Nigel's done any of them. I'll ask him in a second. But there's also uh, you can go on actual courses and practice pool drills and uh, dry drills and that for ditching there as well. And if you're really going to use this kit or be flying overseas, uh, some of those um, courses to, to experience in real life are pretty essential, I would say. Nigel, I don't know if you've ever done one of those ditching kind of survival courses or no, i haven't i've uh i've seen the videos and uh i'll give it a miss thanks <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's well worth doing though if you if you go overseas uh regularly yeah uh, definitely definitely so uh yeah <clears throat> uh just picking up on a few comments uh andy lowe's um about cpl examiners won't uh, allow a change of field selection on the cpl skill test there's an interesting comment that andy as well i might <clears throat> follow that up actually um, with with the CA staff examiners, is that, um, I, I take your point. I don't disagree with it as well. But I'll be interested to know um, <clears throat> what um, what a, CP, a staff examiner view is, rather than maybe an industry examiner on that. So thank you for that. We will we'll follow that up. That will be good. And I can also see quite a few people having sort of power partial power losses, which is interesting um, as well. So overheating, rough running, um, and things like that as well. So it does prove um but there we go and uh there is some people that have done the ditching courses and fully recommend them and some people have um <clears throat> looks like they've been thrown into the sea uh as part uh, to her majesty's pleasure as well looking down there as well so uh yeah excellent so uh yeah brilliant thanks for your input i'm going to hand over now to nigel who's going to really uh get into some more of the detail on uh on standard basic pfls over to you nigel Okay, uh, there's also some uh, questions coming in, so hopefully we're just going to leave those just for the moment because we may well uh, answer them in due course, but uh, we'll come back to them uh, if uh, if we haven't. So standard basic PFLs then. So uh, let's move on to have a discussion on this. And as always, guess what? We're going to start with a poll. So here we go. Uh, so what is the very first action to take in the event of an engine failure at altitude in the cruise okay so is it a select a suitable landing area is it b work out what's gone wrong c make a mayday call or d pitch up convert speed to altitude and then adjust the pitch required to maintain the best glide airspeed so we're after the first item that you or first action that you should do okay so hopefully you'll all be well prepared and you should know that just off the top of your head so let's have a look at the answer then and the correct answer was d uh, and i'm very glad that most people have got that right so that's well done to all of you guys 
So altitude equals time and range, giving you the best option uh, in your selection of landing areas, which is the next thing that you need to do. So the only exception to this might be if you're in a ditching situation out of sight of land, in which case there's a different priority, uh, which comes uh, to the top of the list. But um, we'll talk about that a bit later on, perhaps. Um, so then. Let's move on to uh, some things to do with uh, threat and error management. It might seem a little bit of an oddball thing here, but this is just for completeness uh, to describe the sorts of things that we need to consider if we're practicing force landings. And note the word practicing here. So remember that in a practice scenario, we need to obey all of the associated rules and regulations, whereas in a real force landing, of course, all the rules go out the window and basically we can do what we need to get the aircraft onto the ground. However, what we don't want to do is turn a practice into a real emergency. And we'll think about that a bit later too. So we need to comply with air law, in particular planning on initiating the go around above 500 feet above ground level. That's the safest option rather than using the UK exemption of the 500 feet away from rule. There's a few rules prohibiting uh, or well, there are a few rules that prohibit practicing these or any other emergencies when you have passengers on board your aircraft. There's a couple of caveats to that, but let's leave that one there for the moment. So just remember that in an aircraft that only has one pilot or only requires one pilot, every other person on board is a passenger, whether they hold a license or not. Uh, since that, since only the pilot can log the time in their logbook. Uh, so the only exception to that is when you have an instructor on board. And the reason that that's OK, of course, is because you are both crew, because you are both logging the time. So don't forget, Airlaw also talks about endangering an aircraft. So, you know, you can get caught out on one piece of Airlaw if they don't get you on another one. So uh, you just need to be very, very aware uh, not to um, fall foul of the regulations if you're in this in a practice scenario or practicing your force landings. So there's a few other things we need to consider from a threat and error management point of view. Terrain. So local knowledge is key there. OK, we all know where the pylons are in our local areas, hopefully. Uh, we need to be wary of unseen obstacles. Don't forget at altitude. Um, they, you, know, you won't be able to see them, so they only become apparent at low level. And that means you might then be breaking the low level prohibition rules of the air if you don't see them until the last moment. Uh, other traffic and wildlife, and in this day and age, drones come into that as well. Um, uh, as well as the birds. Uh, we don't want a collision that might again then means we are in a real force landing situation. Uh, car vice and engine cooling, uh, make sure we plan to manage those to avoid a real engine failure into the practice. Um, and then there's pilot or aircraft error. And that's probably one of the biggest threats for practicing this activity without an instructor. Um, there's no one to help you out if you get it wrong or if something goes pear-shaped. So just as an example for, you know, I can say it was actually on a skills test. I gave um, the pilot uh, a simulation and um, uh, ended up in a simulated engine failure. Uh, the aircraft uh, uh, performed correctly. He selected the field. We came down. Uh, he actually selected a field with a row of pylons at the far end. And then when I uh, asked him to go around, he opened the throttle and not a lot happened, <laughs> which uh, sort of got my attention quite quickly. And I took control uh, and there was a problem with the carburetor. The engine actually did respond eventually and we climbed away uh, from only a few feet above the ground. Now, with an additional problem, I've got a face full of pylons ahead of me. So uh, that was quite interesting. Um, just be aware. So. Let's have a look then at some of the other things that we need to consider. So typically we're looking at a procedure that here that commences at ab above 2000 feet. So we're talking about um, uh, a force landing or a practice force landing from the cruise. We're talking about stuff to do here. 
The standard procedure resembles, on purpose, a, uh, a standard circuit, and that's for the ease of visualization for most pilots, particularly when you know you've just learned to fly, and that's why typically we teach this method. So it helps uh, in the visualization of the pattern to achieve, you know, uh, you know, downwind and to be able to land into wind. And I know Matt's going to discuss a little later about another procedure that can also be used. There are lots of ways to skin the force landing cat, so to speak, but we tend to teach people this way in the first place. So first of all, then let's convert excess speed to altitude. We've already said that, and then let's select the best glide speed. Uh, Turning downwind certainly can help because it makes more landing areas available because you've got a greater ground speed. And also it simplifies working out the direction you need to land and hence your selection of the landing area. So when you do select your landing area, you need to not only select it, but plan the circuit around that field. And typically we tend to use high key and low key positions. So there's one question just to answer that that was there um, earlier. Someone asked about, you know, is it easier to judge your thousand feet in a high wing using the strut as a guide or what's a good way to help judge your thousand foot in a low wing in a PA-28? Um, so, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit more detail, but all I'm saying here is actually you should select the position at which you need to be at a thousand feet. So it's done by position rather than references to the aircraft. So we're going to fly the aircraft into a suitable position in relation to, in relation to your landing area to start the procedure, uh, if this is a practice, of course. And then whilst keeping your landing area in sight, you need to perform the checks. So mayday, passenger briefing, and you need to do this in the right order. So the order tends to be, uh, once we've selected our field and we've worked out how we're going to get to it, we need to work out what's gone wrong. Is it something we can fix quite easily? So then we do the mayday call. You need to do that while you've got a, a, a relatively good amount of altitude. Uh, and hopefully you can all remember what uh, what that mayday call should consist of and also what perhaps you might want to squawk. Um, passenger brief, uh, make sure the passenger is all sorted out and then we can then sort out doing the emergency drill in the aircraft. In other words, securing the aircraft uh, and securing the, you know things like fuel loft, mags off and all of those good things there. Um, we need to do the passenger brief before that because that those um, briefings, emergency drills might involve turning the master switch off, of course, and then we lose comms to the passenger unless we want to shout at them. Uh, so don't forget those checks can be formed during any part of the force landing process. But remember to observe the rule, aviate, navigate, and then communicate. All right, in that order. If you have to stop doing the checks because you need to fly the aeroplane, then that's what you need to do. So back to the plan then. So we're trying to achieve the high key position with at least about 1,500 feet above ground level. And if you're lower than that, you'll know that you'll have to then consider being a bit closer to the landing area or even possibly looking for an alternative landing area if it becomes, if your chosen one becomes un unachievable. So on the downwind leg, for want of a better word, uh, typically, the landing area should be no more, no further out than your wingtip, certainly usually within the wingtip or distance of the wingtip. It may well be within this criteria, depending on the height that you're at. Uh, remember, there's always ways to shed height, to lose height, but uh, it's difficult to gain height. <laughs> so uh, don't worry too much about being too high, but you definitely need to worry about being too low and you may need to choose a different field. So aim to get to your low key point, which is typically a thousand feet above ground um, and close in and a beam to the start of your landing. Uh, uh, sorry, close in and a beam, uh, the, the sort of the, the first part of your landing area, as we can sort of see on the screen there. Uh, then we turn on to base leg at 90 degrees to the landing area. So uh, don't at that stage make any allowance for the wind because the base leg, uh, if you fly at right angles, it will then show you how strong the wind is depending on how far you get drifted away from your field. Yeah. So um, when you do find out what the wind's doing, then you can crab in appropriately. Um, 
Base leg is also where you should start to evaluate your height, just like you normally do at a normal airfield, and decide whether you're high or low on the approach. You don't want to wait until you get on to final to do that. You need to do it as part of the base leg, um, uh, leg uh, base leg itself. You should be aiming to touch down about a third of the distance into the landing area. Once you get closer and assured that you are definitely going to get into your field, then you can make some further adjustments and bring that aiming point closer to the beginning of the landing area. Um, but don't overdo it. It's much, much better to be on the ground the right way up and collide with the hedge at the far end. What we don't want to do is fly into the hedge at the near end. OK, so that's the important bit. Um, so what happens then if it's not perfect? Well, if the assessment is that you're too low and uh, when you turn towards the land, um, sorry, if the assessment is that you're too low, then you turn towards the landing area. That's pretty obvious. Yeah. And it's a great place to mention the little gem that Matt is going to talk about later about having multiple choices of landing area available. I know Matt's going to cover that, so I'm not going to steal his thunder there. Um, if the assessment is that you're too high, then we've got several ways out, you know, in which we can lose height. But it's important that we use those ways or those tools in the correct order. Uh, and that's what we're going to cover in a sec. So first of all, um, it's important that initially you maintain the best glide speed. And then if you've got flaps, then you use those to lose height. So you need to try to achieve keeping the landing area or the landing touchdown point in a fixed position in the windshield or in the side window. And that will help you achieve your goal. And your instructors can show you that. Um, some instructors have a little habit of using a China graph pencil and marking an X as to where the aiming point is on the windscreen. And then your objective is to try and keep it there. If you're still too high, then the next thing to do, believe it or not, is to lower the nose. Now you've got all the flaps down and fly just below VFE. And at the same time, you need to adjust your aiming point so that your aim is sort of just within the undershoot of the landing area. So assuming that works, then what will happen is when you raise the nose to reduce your speed, once again, the excess speed will take you then into and over the threshold of your landing area for you to land on. So what happens if we're still too high, even after doing all of those things? Well, the next thing to do is S-turns. So what we're talking about here with an S-turn is you need to make sure you turn, you know, 90 degrees away from your heading. So you, you turn to the right or to the left and you do that while you are at a good high airspeed. In other words, just below VFE. When the turn needs to be reversed, you always turn towards your landing area. Never turn your back on your selected landing area and do a complete circle. Um, if you do that, you'll probably find you won't be able to make the field again. So if necessary, you can do a sort of a shallow figure of eight pattern. So right then towards the field, then left slightly angling away from it. Uh, so you almost maintain your distance from your landing area. But obviously during all of those turns, you are you know, losing altitude, which is what the whole idea is. But it's important that you make all of those turns towards the landing area. Do not turn your back on the field. So in practice, what you'll actually find is you probably only need one S turn, one to the right or to the left, and then back towards the field. And you'll more than likely that will be enough height that you've lost to enable you to make your field. Um, so What's this about side slipping then? Well, <laughs> in practice, that's, you know, only really necessary in aircraft that don't have flaps. So it's just a way of losing altitude uh, without gaining airspeed. Um, and what I've just described above without using side slip is usually more than adequate in losing height. In addition, you know, the risk with side slipping is that you're flying out of balance and that inherently has a risk, especially at low level in a stressful situation. Not a good combination. The risk of a stall spin, especially if you are trying to do that slip at approach speed, is actually quite high. So um, in addition, you might find that some aircraft manufacturers recommend that they, do, they don't recommend slipping when you have got flaps deployed as well. Typically, 172 comes into that bracket when you've got full flaps down. If you must side slip, then 
get someone to show you how to do it properly okay then perform the slipper more than the approach glide speed uh, the increase in speed will mitigate against that stall spin and with the extra drag associated with the slip uh, that combined with the increased airspeed will also increase the amount of descent significantly. But in all cases, you need to get rid of that slip and, you know, before you get relatively close to the ground. We want to we want to get back onto the glide, you know, a sensible glide angle of approach uh, using the slip and then return to normal flight uh, to, to finish it off close to the ground. So the final thing then for my bit really, uh, or nearly my bit, is um, it's not over yet. <laughs> so most of the training that people do, they say, OK, you know, we're, we're going to make it into that field. Practice for slowing. Yes, let's climb away and go around. But if this is for real, you are going to land in a field. And do you know what you are required to then do? OK, so here it is for completeness. Obviously, we need to get out of the aeroplane, uh, you know, assuming no one, you know, people haven't been injured and things. And trust me, if you put the aeroplane on the ground the right way up, it doesn't really matter what's going to happen to it after that. You're going to walk away from it. Um, evacuate the aircraft, ensuring the aircraft is secure, you know, make sure, double check you've turned the master switch off and the fuel off. You are then legally required to contact the police. 112 or 999. You are also legally required to contact distress and diversion. Um, that can can be done via an airfield. Uh, if you've made a mayday call, no doubt they will have, have contacted D&D &D for you anyway. But if not, you need to ring them. OK, uh, and uh, we'll make the number available when uh, when when if you don't know it already, but it is quite, you know, it's freely available if you just Google it and uh, have a search for distress, distress and diversion. It's a normal, uh, you know, UK landline number. Ideally, you should stay with the aircraft until help arrives. But obviously that depends on the situation or if you're able to or if you need to find medical assistance or you need to seek, seek shelter from the from the elements. OK, so that's what happens if you end up on the ground okay in a real force landing situation so let's have a quick look at partial power engine failures then so i'm just going to say something these failures are responsible for more fatalities than a full engine failure let's let that sink in okay in other words, if you have a full engine failure, you're practiced at those, hopefully, and you're trained to deal with them. Partial powers are killers. They are the ones that kill more people uh, in aircraft when they happen than full engine failures. So partial power, then, the training for it is really quite important. And if you haven't experienced this training, then you really do need to make it a priority from some reputable and up to date training organization or instructor. Um, <clears throat> the handling of the scenario depends very much on your stage of student pilot training. If you are a student and the CAA are currently looking into officially including this uh, scenario and training for it into the PPL syllabus. But for the purposes of tonight, we're just going to concentrate on partial power occurring from the crews within the context of handling force landings. So before this scenario happens, all pilots, you ought to ex uh, experiment and find the minimum power that you need to maintain altitude at the best glide speed in your aeroplane. And if you don't know that, go and find it when the next fly. OK, that's the that's the key piece of information that you'll need. Um, although technically the flight at minimum power should be achieved at the minimum sink speed, it's just easier to do it at the best glide speed. So the purpose of the exercise is to get an idea of the minimum power required for a given aircraft and a given mass on a given day in order to be able to maintain that glide speed. And uh, that information is expanded upon and used in relation with partial power when we're decision making in a timely manner because it comes a key piece of information instead of a bit of trial and error to determine if you excuse me can maintain uh, uh altitude okay so then this becomes a if i've got this much power or less i know i'm going to be descending so if we look at some of the actions to take if that scenario is encountered um first of all we need to achieve the best glide speed and we need to 
head for the nearest airfield if we think we can maintain altitude. Try to identify the cause of the power loss. Um, we definitely need to make a pan-pan uh, RT call. Um, and then also, if we're able to maintain altitude, we pre-pick our force landing areas en route on the way back to our airfield just in case the engine fails completely so we're not wasting time picking a field if if it happens um if you manage to get to your destination airfield then don't join the circuit okay you need to be able uh, to remember that uh, you know you you the engine might fail at any time so we don't want to be too far away from the field to <coughs> to actually um make the aircraft land on the air on the airfield um, the recommended thing to do would be to go to the overhead and then strangely uh, give yourself a practice force landing, close the throttle and glide to your airfield runway. And that way you're not reliant upon any partial power. So if it does fail, it doesn't matter. And the chances are, if you need a bit of power, then you're going to have it if you, if you, you know, if you don't quite get it quite right in your glide. Um, that also applies if you can't main if you can't get to your airfield then use whatever whatever power you have to get to a suitable force landing field and then close the throttle and give yourself a force landing you know an idle power into your selected field so the important thing is is don't try to get home don't use get home itis okay so don't just try and get home uh, you know, losing height more and more and more and then get to your airfield at 50 feet with nothing left to do except to land in the trees. So, uh, you know, you just need to think about that. It's all very much a decision uh, making process, partial power, really. Uh, once you've thought about it and have that process in your head, then you're in a good place to uh, able to be able to handle that if and when it occurs. OK, so back to Matt. Uh, thanks, Nigel. So much information, so much to think about and cover. You can tell poor old Nigel's voice is struggling there as he's had to get so much over in the time available there as, as well. So we've got some great questions and comments coming in as well. Uh, there's a couple uh, of questions I'll, I'll just uh, take now because it's kind of relevant uh, here as well. So David Daniels has asked for aircraft with retractable gear. What's the view on landing wheels up? So I'll quote from the... Um, the Piper Arrow flight manual, um, it says whether to attempt to land in with gear up or down depends on many factors, as ever. Um, it says if the field is smooth and firm and long enough to bring the plane to a stop, the gear should be down. Makes sense. If there are stumps or rocks or other large obstacles in the field, the gear in the down position will better protect the occupants of the aircraft. OK, that makes sense. And it says, however, if the field is suspected to be excessively short or soft, or when landing in water of any depth, a wheels up landing will normally be safer and do less damage to the airplane. Uh, and touchdown should always be made at the lowest possible speed. So there you go. That's uh, that's the kind of answer there. Uh, yeah. So if you think it's runway like and good, or there's obstacles that are going to potentially penetrate the cabin, gear down. But if you think it's soft or short, or if you're going into water, gear up. So that's the Piper Arrow advice. And I think that's pretty common, similar advice to uh, to most aircraft uh, types as well. So that was a good question there as well. Uh, and there's another question here. And I know Nigel will be itching to answer this one. Um, do you have to squawk 7700 if you've already communicated your mayday on the frequency you were on? So the answer to that is, is uh, if you have been allocated a discrete squawk by the controller, in other words, one of their own squawks, and you make the mayday on their frequency, <laughs> oh, dear me, I'll get the frog in my throat sore soon, <laughs> um, then, um, then you don't squawk 7700. You maintain the squawk that you have been allocated. So you only squawk 7700 if you're on just a general cost security squawk or... Um, if you don't get a reply on your first call to your current frequency, then if you change to D and D one to one decimal five, then you would also change your score to seven seven zero zero. Brilliant. Thank you. Another good question. That right. Let's move on then to some alternative PFL procedures. So I just talked about your um, your pretty common every day. Let's look at a, a few of a nuanced procedures. Um, but first, just get you thinking and uh, active again. 
let's have another poll. And this one, you might not necessarily answer, but what's the lowest recommended height to deploy a ballistic recovery parachute in a Cirrus aircraft? Is it 400 feet, 1,000 feet, 800 feet, 200 feet? These are all above ground level heights. And when we say lowest recommended height is, uh, what is it the most, um, what's, it, what's it kind of certified? When will it work is what we're talking about here. So uh, by what height will deploying it actually work uh, for a hopefully safe outcome? So 400 for AGL, 1,000 for AGL, 800 for AGL or 200 for... And as ever with all of these things, uh, there is some nuances on this, um, but uh, have a look at what we get. So there you go. Those are your choices. Uh, the correct answer uh, is actually A. So that's for the um, the the, new, the the below G5 models. The G5 and above models were a higher uh, weight. Nigel and I had a good good debate over the email about this as well. Um, they're 560 feet. Um, the earlier models are, are 400. Um, really, um, 920 feet is in a spin. There might be another figure you think. Lots of factors can affect this as well. But yeah, down to 400 foot. So the reason we put this question in is it's quite low to be effective. Um, but if you get into some of the Cirrus uh, transition training there as well, they talk about up to 500 feet. It's recommended to go ahead and things like that as well. Um, so uh, I think 560, and I think somebody's just commented, yeah, Cirrus G6, 600 uh, there as well. So it, the actual figure is not really important, but just out of interest, it's quite effective, quite low down. I know some of the parachutes I fly with uh, talk about you can get out at um, a thousand foot, I just above circuit height quite effectively, and you've got to be going and pretty competent and quick to get that. I think there was the chap that bailed out um, of a historic aircraft at Duxford some years ago, um, and he did it, and he got out at those kind of things with a parachute, uh, a, a back warm parachute, but he was very competent, very good, and very practiced at it. So um, you've got to be good, but just out of interest. Right. So force landings below 1,500 feet. So if an engine failure occurs at low altitude, your time to complete your checklist actions or flying a pattern may be very limited or even impossible. And you're going to have to decide how many, if any, of the drills to complete. But above all, as Nigel's already really hammered on, and we will keep hammering on about, um, you must keep control of the aircraft and then decide and get on with flying a force landing plan. Now, this is one thing way I talk about it um, that you might like to consider it. So immediately following the engine failure, take advantage of any speed in excess of the gliding speed and use the extra energy available to convert speed to height. We've already talked about this. This is just the same. Consider trying to turn so that the nearest wingtip is aligned with the surface wind on the DI. So you can see the example here on the screen of wind from 140 degrees. This then focuses your field selection in an arc from the nose to the wingtip. You can prioritize looking for a field in this 90 degree arc. You're effectively already straight into a base leg. You can then select a field judge and make a final turn into wind using all those good techniques that Nigel's just talked about. You can always use the techniques early if you're high or low versus your chosen field, of course, as well. And any possible restart attempt must be action without delay. And you really need to try to discontinue that attempt and focus in on flying the aircraft unless it's, it's a real quick restoration of power. Shutdown drills where appropriate must also be action promptly and the aircraft made as safe as possible. But yeah, basically you're straight into, in this case, uh, uh, you know, a left base leg there as well. And it just, I, it might be something you want to practice. Um, it's very easy to go and practice all your PFLs from two and a half, three thousand feet. Try doing one at kind of this height. You know, it's that day where you're flying around under a lowish overcast and you can bet your bottom dollar that'll be the day but you have your engine failure and you haven't got the time to be faffing around trying to look all around the field section. This may just help hone your field selection and judgment and let you uh, uh, get on with things as well. Well worth one to practice, I suggest. Uh, we should also mention emergency descents because everything up to now is focused on a nice controlled descent to a suitable landing. In some situations, 
getting on the ground in the shortest possible time may be the priority. Let us know in the chat box uh, reasons or situations where you think you might want time is of the essence uh, there as well. Uh, an engine fire. Yeah, everybody's coming in. Engine fire straight onto it. Uh, that's one that's not going out um, is, is definitely um, uh, one. But also a cabin fire as well. I know somebody uh, that had a very uh, nasty uh, avionics fire. So not an engine fire, um, but an avionics fire. And even though this is all the good stuff with the circuit breakers and that, it was still pumping out really horrible, acrid electrical smoke in the cabin uh, there as well. Um, and health reasons as well, medical emergencies as well, is another good reason. That could definitely be a scenario. But what we're talking about is rapid descent and landing. So time's the priority here as well. Uh, now, emergency descents should be performed as recommended by your manufacturer. Uh, including configuration and air speeds. But in general terms, you want to reduce power to idle and prop if equipped should be placed in the, the high RPM position. And that allows the propeller to act as an aerodynamic brake to prevent excessive airspeed buildup during the descent. If you've got gear and flaps, they should be extended. And that's all about getting maximum drag so the descent can be made as rapidly as possible, but without the airspeed building up. And that's what you've got to really monitor. You don't want the airspeed to pass V and E or the a gear speed or the maximum flap extended speed. So you want to get flap gear out, uh, get prop high, and then dive pretty much as close to VFE as you can get. Um, also, in the event of an engine fire, the high airspeed could help blow out the fire, um, but it, it, may, it may not do. Um, but uh, like I say, it's all about getting drag, getting the altitude off as quickly as possible. Um, only other thing to remember is, remember, you'll be coming down quite quick in this scenario as well. So you should start to ease out of this emergency descent at a high enough altitude in order to get things like the speed and your aiming point back under control for, for the actual landing. Uh, any people that have done uh, single engine CPLs uh, in recent times or whatever will probably remember this fondly. You know, back in the day when we used to do lots of single engine CPLs and arrows and stuff, this was always very much a, uh, a key maneuver as part of the CPL practice and test as well for the singles as well. So some of you may have done it, but it's well worth um, one uh, practicing uh, there as well. Yeah, and somebody said there, somebody's some a chipmunk person or a tandem as well. Yeah. You got an instructor's uh, head or somebody in the front there as well. So yeah, you might need to get good visibility to pull out. Absolutely. Um, uh, and uh, Nigel, uh, time has got the end. He probably tells what an emergency uh, descent in his Harvard's like, but I imagine it's quite busy and noisy uh, and exciting. So, um, ballistic recovery systems. We already touched on these uh, in the question here as well. And if you're not familiar with these, they're parachute systems designed to recover the aircraft and the occupants in an emergency. So, uh, you know, BPRS or BRS could save your life, but just be aware, um, you know, the installation designers, they can't be expected to cover all circumstances or design an installation that can safely recover in all emergency situations. Um, even after a successful deployment, control is largely lost and the trajectory and impact point is out of control of the pilot. You're kind of almost a passenger to the airframe and the parachute at this stage. Even if you're landing on relatively good terrain, you're still going to have a high descent rate here. It's going to reduce the risk of serious injury or death, but there's still some significant uh, risks there as well. Um, and it's generally accepted that a BRS, it's, it's another chance. It's another, it's another thing in your toolbox, to kind of use that cliche again there as well. Um, in the UK, BOS is installed on, approved on the basis that whilst not deployed, it won't hazard the aircraft, its occupants or ground personnel. Now, the UK approval process does not consider deployment of the system and whether it can safely recover the aircraft. So just because it may be necessarily UK approved, it might have different degrees of effectiveness. The approval and installation and safety is all about, like I say, the, the safety and installation and the working mechanisms of the controls of it there as well. So, and, you know, if the BRS fires on the ground, the rocket's got the potential to cause serious injury to death. So these are, these are explosive devices. We have to treat them with, with respect. 
Um, in which case we only arm them for flight. We take real good control of the safety pins before and after flight. And you know we have to be very diligent with checklists and shutdown checks uh, on these as well. Um, you'll see as well, there's been lots of publicity post aircraft accidents in educating first responders and actually putting um, decals and notices and information out on aircraft as well. There's been some quite improvements in, in recent years uh, on that as well. Um, the BMA have some excellent reading material on this from a technical point of view as well. Uh, Talif has just put a link of uh, the PDF in the cusp. There's some really good stuff out there on that. The LAA, I think, have got some similar technical leaflets there as well. So um, uh, what I, I do say is if you're going to fly aircraft with a BRS fitted, uh, get some good training and advice on that so you know, understand the system, you know how to operate it, and you know what it will and won't do for you. Uh, that's it for those, excellent. We're going to go on in to back to Nigel to talk about some top tips for the skills test in a minute here as well. We have just got, there's a couple of questions come in just about the emergency descent. And Nigel, did you want to pick one up, which I think? Uh, I, don't, I don't mind. Uh, the emergency descent, someone's asked um, in the emergency, emergency descent, are you better off fly descending at VFE with flaps fully extended or at VNE with the aircraft clean? Um, basically you want some drag in there so vfe with the flaps extended is the better option uh vne uh you run the risk at vne of actually making the fire worse uh because uh if you you know we all know if you blow a fan on a fire it tends to uh, ignite it and make it burn hotter so uh the objective really is to is to lose altitude quickly uh so you get on the ground sooner that's the real objective of the emergency descent uh, there was also one there about, um, uh, I don't know whether you want to pick that up. My, my instructor also taught me unless the part is, unless it's pilot incapacitation or serious structural issue, then fly it, don't float it. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you want to mention, uh, talk about that? Uh, yes, uh, I think, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I think uh, everything is very scenario based, really, is you've got to look at exactly what, what you're dealing with uh, in there as well. I mean, it's it's very difficult to give an exact answer to this as well. You know, if you've got, I don't know, an avionics fire in the aircraft, yes, you do want to get down really quickly. But if a little bit more time is going to get you to a far safer, better landing area, you've got to try and make that judgment. And that's a real dynamic risk assessment in the cockpit. Uh, depending on what you're faced with as well. We've talked about it in lots of other workshops as well, but don't forget the startle factor. When something happens, there is that bit of time. The, I was with another pilot. There was, we were both PPLs at the time, and um, we'd just turned crosswind, and the engine went bang and stopped, as in proper froze, stopped with smoke and the aircraft, a bit of torque roll in a Cessna 152 out of RAF Holton um, some years back. And I think we both had that moment of both looking at each other. What have you done? What's happened there? What happened? And, you know, that bit of time. So, you know, that startle factor, the Sully movie covers it brilliantly, will rob you of time as well. It's all very well as talking about it in here, but for real, you're going to have that factor in there as, as well. Um, there was one other question I was going to mention. There was a lot of people talking about, um, you know, don't just – bias your your field selection in one particular area and how students often concentrate the lookout on the left hand side of the aircraft if there as well yeah i think i think that's a very valid comment there as well um some of it of course is what visibility you've got out of the right and again it's that dynamic risk assessment and balance I don't know what nigel thinks but you know i i try and teach my students and test candidates if you're in the left hand seat to fly a left hand pattern um, if you've got a field to the right and you want to fly a right hand pattern when you're a bit more experienced and that is capable it's good but sometimes for students or more inexperienced pilots that cross cockpit visibility just stacks the cards against them and makes life difficult for them so i think it's a balance um but i, I take the point nigel i don't know what you think of that uh, yeah, I agree. Generally, you've got to be much closer to the field, and that makes vis you know uh, visual and reference to that field through the cockpit much much more difficult. So yeah, I would I would agree with Matt. You know, stick to the side that you're sitting and do the circuit on that side. It gives you much much greater visibility. Brilliant. Yeah. No. And Tif is just if I mentioned startle factor, distraction, and things like that. Um, touches on the subject. Uh, Tif has put the link in there 
in the box as well, which is another good, really good uh, one of the new CA Safety Sense leaflets there as well. Um, I'm going to pick it up now as well. I know we're prolonging it, but it's it's a relevant thing. Um, some people have asked about um, whether you um, would teach passengers uh, to deploy the chute should the pilot be incapacitated uh, and things like that. Um, so, which is an interesting point. I, I believe that is part of the teaching, I think, Nigel, it, isn't it? It is, yes, yeah, certainly in the yeah. Cirrus world, uh, part, of the, part of the passenger brief is to tell the passengers how to deploy the chute. It's actually quite straightforward and then how to shut the engine down because um, that's the next requirement if it was already there. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, there is there is the serious way of doing things. I know there's been some comments there about um, you know uh, about either you know irrespective of whether you've got a BRS system, you should fly the airplane if you can. Um, well, Cirrus have a different view. Um, your Cirrus insurance might also have a different view. Uh, if you de if you decide not to pull the chute in an engine failure situation, and that's generally because you will cause more damage by trying to land the aircraft yourself at 90 knots than you would with the ballistic system that brings the aircraft down. And believe it or not, they actually reuse the aircraft again. You can rebuild an aircraft that's been used on a ballistic recovery system on Cirrus. Uh, they get them back into the air again. So uh, there's some other things to consider as well, uh, yeah. specifically with Cirrus. Uh, but yeah, all good stuff. But there, the, I think there's been a few that have ended <laughs> up in people's back gardens near <laughs> Gloucester, actually, haven't they? But are now back flying, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, no, uh, really good, um, good input. Thanks, everybody. And there's a few more questions coming in, which we'll be delighted to pick up at the end. So I'm going to go back uh, to Nigel and let's okay. uh, wrap some of this up with some examiner top tips. Over Wait. to you, Nigel. We will. OK, so in uh, is our usual style. And this one is a test to see if you've been listening this evening. <laughs> so here we go, then a poll on this one. What should you score if you have a total engine failure in the cruise? So is it answer A, 7700 perhaps or 7700 every time? Or is it C, you score 0030? Or is it D, you either score 2000 or 7000, depending if you're IFR or VFR? So that's if you have a total engine failure in the cruise. So that's, I think, pretty straightforward because uh, we've sort of covered that already, to be fair. So let's have a look at what the correct answer was. It is, of course, perhaps. Let's see how many people got the answer. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> uh, everyone uh, hopefully was listening earlier. So uh, you only squawk 7700 uh, if you haven't been allocated a discrete squawk by ATC. So in that case, if you have been uh, given a discrete squawk, then you would make the Mayday call on your current frequency and you should retain the squawk that they have already given you. OK, and I mentioned earlier on, if you need to change to one to one decimal five, then that's when you would squawk seven, seven, zero, zero. Or if you uh, if you talk to if you make your Mayday on any frequency and you are currently squawking the conspicuity code seven thousand, then you would also squawk seven, seven, zero, zero as well. OK, so let's move on then and let's have a chat about these examiner top tips. So. Like everything else in the skills test, uh, the examiner should use scenarios for each of the exercises you're going to be asked to perform. So this will be briefed at the beginning of the skills test, but the scenario that will be used will still be unknown to you until it actually happens, of course. So it's, in the, you know, for a PFL in the skills test, it is highly, highly unlikely the examiner is just going to go, ha-ha, and pull the throttle. OK, there's usually a scenario that leads up to it. OK, so it's all based on, you know, trying to make it as realistic as possible. But ultimately, you know, you're going to end up with a complete simulated engine failure that you need to deal with. So the important thing that I'm sort of saying here is listen to the scenario given and think out loud. So this is probably one of the most misunderstood parts of the skills test in that the examiner is looking for you to take appropriate decisions and actions for the scenario that they're given. So many instructors, yes, I'm going to have a dig at instructors here. Uh, I'm an instructor as well. Many instructors just teach a student how to execute a standard set of checks and then execute the practice force landing. 
okay so uh irrespective as to what the problem is so what we tend to find is that most candidates on test take inappropriate actions so i'll give you an example if if we end up with a scenario is an engine fire then after the initial engine fire checks have been performed which hopefully include shutting it down then there really isn't a need to go through the what's gone wrong checks and trying to restart it OK, and that's typically, you know, what somebody would do if they haven't been taught to in this scenario based method and they're just running through the mantra of the same checks all the time. So the checks are there, but you need to decide which ones you need for the given scenario. So you'll also be briefed and you should use touch drills. And that means the examiner is expecting you to just touch the controls or the equipment that you are verbalizing the actions for. So, for example, uh, you touch the fuel cutoff valve and say fuel would be off. OK, so that's what we're looking for. It's equally important that if you decide not to do something, that you say why this is the case. Otherwise, the examiner may think you've just forgotten it. So, for example, again, if you decide, let's let's give you an example. If 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 you decide not, you haven't got enough time to make a mayday call, then say so. OK, that doesn't mean you failed the task. It's all part of that good old thing called airmanship. However, make sure the reason is justified before you all go off and say, Nigel said that you don't have to do a melee call. Uh, make sure it's justified. You can't just say you haven't got time. OK, uh, if you then spend the next two minutes twiddling your thumbs, all right, while you're doing your perfect force landing. All right. So you have to have a good reason. It has to be realistic. Above all, as we've always said, fly the aircraft on test uh, and in real life, of course. Examiners potentially don't give brownie points for doing perfect checks at the expense of not making the field or crashing, shall we say, into something on the approach. It's a simulated real life situation. So do what you would do in real life. OK, providing you've got a good excuse, uh, so I, I mean, reason, sorry, get that right. OK, reason for doing something or not doing something, then the examiner will take that into consideration. OK, so finally, it's, you know, strangely back to threat and error management again. And that's where we started early this evening. So ensure you've got a clear understanding as to who is responsible for warming the engine during any PFL. Technically, in my book, if I if I'm doing a, a skills test for somebody, the examiner will brief that. And in my book, it's the examiner that undertakes that engine warming task, because this is, you know, a test of you handling an, an engine failure. And you wouldn't normally be doing that if you had one for real. Now, obviously, I would tell the candidate I'm about to warm the engine slightly, OK, so that it doesn't come unexpected. Other examiners might have a different view. Uh, it, it's it's uh, half a dozen one and six of the other as, as to you know why examiners may or may not choose to do that. But that's the way that I do it. So if you're not briefed on the test, OK, as to what that process is going to be, ask the question at the briefing stage. If the examiner wants you to do it, then you do it. If the examiner says that they're going to do it, then you know what the score is. OK, so that's really in a really tight nutshell. Some tips about, you know, the, the skills test or the PFL part of the skills test. Matt, any 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 uh, views or shall we? Uh, um, yeah, the, no, uh, excellent. Thanks, uh, Nigel. The only um, difference is uh, depending on the power of your aircraft or how slippy it is and that some types uh, you may need to adjust the pitch attitude when you're making an engine warm to keep to keep the speed um, appropriate as well. Um, certainly some of the uh, military types we train on, we teach you have to synchronize a pitch up as you apply power and then pitch back down again just to keep the glide speed from accelerating out as well. So the candidate does do that. But I mean, that, if you're in something like a Grob Prefect that's very powerful or something like that you know um uh, you may need to to think about that but um yeah generally um you know the other thing i'll comment as well is there's a difference between an engine response check which is just checking that the engine still responds and an engine warm when you practice in practice force landings if you're operating in very cold conditions and your flight manual may even have 
specific temperature advice on this as well. You may need to keep the engine power on, um, you know, for a good, you know, one banana, two banana, three banana, whatever you use to help yourself count to get the engine warm as opposed to just checking that it responds there as well. Um, so um, well worth reading up uh, what advice is for your particular aircraft uh, there as well. Um, it, it, again, all sorts of different views uh, on that will come on, on there as well. Um, also to say, some of this is based around um, your typical light training aircraft there as well. If you're flying historic aircraft, you may have um, considerable engine husbandry problems. Uh, you know, you you know, practicing PFLs to a certain degree may be inappropriate on on some very historic uh, types as well. So again, or, or types that are very prone to carb icing in certain conditions. Um, Nigel, I don't know what Harvard's like in PFLs, and uh, I imagine it uh, it comes down quite rapidly. I don't know. Uh, it can do, but just like you say, it's very rare that we actually um, do, a, a, dare I say, a proper PFL in a Harvard. We tend to keep the power on the engine uh, during the descent. Uh, so we're after a judgment for the current um, configuration of the aircraft uh, for the force landing in, in something big like a Harvard. We, we, we tend not to do it at idle because it is just too harsh on the engine uh, and they're too valuable to do that with. Uh, brilliant. Um, thanks. So that's the end of the uh, the taught um, uh, bit. So what we'll do is some of you um, have got some great questions uh, coming up. Chris Applegarth had a radio fire, had one in a Bulldog. Yes, I know somebody had one in a Grumman AA5. And an avionics fire was particularly nasty, actually, because there is a lot, and I mean a lot of black smoke. And it's the kind of smoke that also makes you choke and... Uh, and that as well. So, um, yes, particularly unhappy. Uh, um, Julian Dow has asked, choice of landing area, quiet road, question mark. Um, this is an interesting one. I'll get Nigel's view in a minute as well. There has been some people have made force landing on road, even recently. I think it was Gloucester again. I'm not picking out Gloucester. I mentioned Gloucester before. But I think it was a, um, uh, a very early variant of Firefly ended up safely on the road on the central reservation, I think it was. It was quite an amazing photo very recently at Gloucester. And you may have seen on the, you know, internet, YouTubes and things, it, this is not in common uh, in America where they land on roads. Uh, often they have lots of challenges with the terrain surrounding roads. So around is probably a better option. Uh, what I would say about going for roads in the UK, our roads tend to be quite busy. Um if if you hit other people, I think you're potentially putting uh, third parties, the general public, uh, potentially at some considerable risk by trying to, to land on a road. Um, and also roads often have road furniture around in the UK um, and can be narrow and twisty and things like that. So uh, personally, I, I don't think there's that many scenarios where a road would would be good maybe if you were over uh, like say the peak district or somewhere like that where you've got a long flat some of the roads on the isle of Wight, around some of the south side maybe potentially but i would be very uh, worried about um the risk to third parties personally but nigel i don't know what you've ever thought or discussed on that no, I'm I'm with you on that one. I mean, you know, most of the most of the videos that you see there on there in 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 our friends across the pond in the states where the roads are much larger, um, and and most places it's less busy. Uh, uh, it, in my book, it's it's going to be a recipe for disaster, uh, and it really is a last you know last ditch attempt to you were trying to get the aeroplane on the ground, and the risk is too high for all the things that Matt's mentioned. You know, furniture and in particular third party injuries because we all know what the legal process is like in this country, unfortunately. Um, even though you're trying to save your souls and those on board, if you kill other people in the process, well, you're going to have to answer for that as well. So uh, I would steer clear of roads if it was me personally. Yeah. A very good friend of mine um, had a theory um, that uh, uh, we talk about roads at night or roads are better option than night flying um, as well. And a good friend of mine had a theory that more roads were uh, fields were longer parallel to roads rather than perpendicular to roads. So we uh, we went out um, 
uh, to, to one of our local pubs, did a long walk, and we decided to assess this theory on the way home by looking at each field. And that was quite a long walk home for various reasons. It had been quite a long night out. Uh, and the conclusion we came to is there is absolutely no uh, no pattern or logic to it whatsoever in the UK. The fields are all sorts of random uh, shapes, sizes, directions and everything. There is no uh, thing. So is a road a good option at night? Uh, yeah, you know, again, furniture, uh, twists and turns and all the rest of it. And as somebody's just mentioned, if you're in West Oxfordshire, the chances of taking off your undercarriage on a pothole is is pretty much guaranteed <laughs> uh, as well. It's particularly awful uh, around here as well. Um, there's one question I'm going to come back. Jane Stubbs has asked, um, and I'm going to ask Nigel this. As we need to turn into wind, we need surface wind. Yeah, we're good you're on it. But I have winds aloft marked on my chart. Do we just take off 30 degrees to take account of backing at low level? So this question is basically all about what's the best way of assessing the surface wind, I think. Well, in the good old days, of course, if you if you if you went flying in the right time of year when they were stubble burning, uh, then smoke was always a good indication. But that's quite rare these days that you get to see the smoke. Sometimes if the fields are full of wheat and stuff, you can see a bit like, you know, the wind going across the top of the wheat, uh, the waves that, you know, you see the wind direction like the waves on the surface of, a, of some water. Um, I mean, anything that helps, really, I always say to people, you know, uh, unless you're going on a long cross country, think about the runway you took off on and think about what the wind was doing in relation to that runway. Um, you know, but ultimately uh, it depends what altitude you're flying at as to what wind you've got marked on your chart. Probably I know generically most people tend to fly around about the 2000 foot wind. Uh, so, you know, if you've got that marked on your chart, then it might be an idea to uh, to have a think about that. Don't forget the 30 degrees is only a very rough rule of thumb. There will be local uh, variations to that with terrain that may have an impact on it and also <laughs> wind speed uh, and obstacles and stuff like that. So, you know, anything that sort of helps your... Um, helps your core, <coughs> so to speak, is uh, is a good idea. Uh, but there are no hard and fast rules about it. So uh, ideally, you know, as long as you've got an idea and you're going to land roughly into wind, then, uh, you know, that's that's good enough. You know, you don't want to land into wind at the expense of uh, shortening your field. So if you've got a, a field that's short in one direction and long in a different direction, but slightly more out of wind, oh, well, you know, I think I'd choose the longer option and, and, and land, you know, slightly more crosswind than into wind into a short field. So, Matt, I don't know whether you've got some options and views. Yeah, I think the one thing I would say is that um, people get very obsessed about the surface wind, quite yeah. rightly, because it's a real consideration. But most of the aircraft we've got can take a decent crosswind. So, you know, even Warrior, 17 knots, um, or, you know, your Cessna's up to like 13, 14 knots as well. So don't be afraid to accept a bit of a crosswind if you've got a, a really good good field would be my would be my advice as well yeah getting into wind is is definitely a key consideration but we can abs uh, accept a bit of a crosswind if it means we're going to make a uh, a really good landing area there as well so um yeah um other questions that we're going to pick up somebody directed me in the chat to one and it was a good point because i just scrolled back and found it so thank you who directed me to that uh, I'm going to ask Nigel this one before I'm scribbling it down. Somebody talked about the differences between a static propeller, a stop propeller, versus a windmilling propeller effectively as well, and the, what difference that will make. Um, considerable difference uh, is, is my yeah, uh, quick answer, but Nigel will give us the uh, his more detailed view. Uh, yeah, if you've got a propeller that stops, that's going to create less drag than a propeller that is still rotating. OK, so that's the quick answer expanded um, and it's all to do with the aerodynamics. Um, and uh, basically, if you've got a rotating disc, it's a bit like, you know, having a, a sheet of paper in front of you as opposed to a strip of paper in front of you uh, that creates the drag. So rotating propellers can produce um, um, uh, 
quite a lot of drag actually so if you have got an aircraft with a stop propeller you may well find your glide range increases uh, quite significantly um, what we tend to do in aircraft that have got vp props and specifically in twins when they do the uh, and matt can come back onto this when you do an engine failure on a twin um, an asymmetric engine failure to simulate um, a stopped prop what they actually do is they actually uh, have the engine running um, at uh, at a setting that gives them the same drag as a as a stopped prop so you actually do provide a bit of thrust from the engine to simulate a propeller that has been stopped so yeah there you go in a short answer stop propellers increase your glide range so in the da42 about 12 percent power yep is about um is the correct figure people said it a bit higher to get rid of some of the noise nuisance warnings but about 12 percent is actually uh what it will you know you can add add that power to simulate the uh the feathering jewels have, have been um completed successfully so you know in terms of percentage power uh does make uh, quite a difference if you want to experience it for real uh if you've got contacts or um able to go motor gliding uh, you can go and practice this for real. So if you go in a motor glider, um, you can actually try doing some PFLs with the engine running, and then you can actually shut the engine down in gliding range of the airfield, come back and do a full-on glide landing back to the airfield and experience it for real. It's really helpful um, thing to do, and it's uh, it's definitely um, you know really brings it into into perspective there as well. Um, other question uh, I'm going to put. Um, some Ted Richards has asked, what's the legal requirement to inform police and D of, D of an off-field landing? Nigel, we mentioned this in your talk there. So I think some of this comes from kind of um, not necessarily aviation law, but just law, uh, yeah. common law of the land. So I'll let Nigel expand. Yeah, it, it is. And certainly the police need to be informed. Well, let's let's take a step backwards. Normally, uh, you'll have made a mayday call or certainly someone will have con contact D&D &D on your behalf. Um, so D&D, uh, &D really, if you give them a call once you're on the ground, it gives them a, a, a breath of relief, so to speak, that they're talking to the pilot that's had the problems. They know you're OK. D&D &D also contacts the police. Uh, so by you contacting the police as well, again, it just joins up all of the circles required from a reporting process. Because don't forget, you have actually landed on somebody's property. Um, uh, and let's hope they're friendly <laughs> um, uh, to let you, you know, get the aeroplane out of there again. Um, but again, you know, if, it's just a question of making sure you follow the, the correct procedures so there isn't any comeback on you at any point uh, in time uh, the, the police also get involved because um, obviously it's uh, quite a rare event and it can involve people you know the word of mouth going around and getting spectators and uh, you know uh, you know um, roads being clogged up if you're, if, if you're quite popular shall we say um, so they then have all the um, things in process to uh, to make sure that, that doesn't happen and to keep people moving along um, and uh, also the security of the aircraft is also another thing um, with you know uh, they it has been known that they will put a police guard on an aircraft uh, overnight if that is the case, if it's in a particularly vulnerable situation. So uh, for all of those reasons, um, uh, that, that's the reason why. I'm actually, last week I flew an aircraft out of a field, a farmer's field, from, uh, it had had an engine failure the previous week and it got fixed. Uh, we made the decision that it was good enough to fly out of that field. Um, so uh, that was quite an interesting experience, shall we say, uh, walking the field with a pedometer to work out the distances mm. and doing the calculations with the uh, telegraph wires, which are at the far end in 450 metres. So, um, you know, uh, it, again, it's just all part and parcel of keeping everybody happy and keeping everybody informed is the important bit. No, brilliant. Thanks, Sasha. Um Last point we'll make just before we wrap up, really, is uh, somebody's mentioned uh, W3W. That's what three words? You may have appeared that now it's an app that you can get on your phone and it segments the um, well the world really into small squares. I think each one's about a metre and a half, two metres uh, wide and it is a way that emergency services can help uh, triangulate them. It's a free app that's on your phone and uh, it's uh, three metres by three metres. There we go. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, uh, there as well. In fact, our play park in our village, we're just putting our what three words location on our emergency signage as well. So to help uh, um, 
uh, you know, locate that as well. So it's a really good free app, well worth having on, on your phone and it can potentially help uh, triangulate you to get your help. Of course, if you're on a mobile phone, emergency services can normally triangulate uh, to a degree by that as well. And uh, you should uh, ideally, uh, unless you're in a non-part 21 aircraft, always be flying with uh, some kind of personal locator beacon uh, yeah. as well. Um, that uh, that you can get, uh, um, you know, um, you can fire that off as well and help get, uh, you know, emergency services uh, to you as well. Uh, of course, if you're injured or in inclement weather conditions, that speed of response that can make all of the difference uh, for for certain. So uh, there we go. Um, Great engagement tonight as well. Uh, lots of you have been students and learning to fly on the call tonight as well, uh, which is brilliant to have you with us as well. Uh, just remember, you know, what we've been discussing here tonight are just some ideas, some hints, tips and techniques as well. Um, please, uh, you know, take the advice and training of your own training organisation, your own instructors and uh, your own examiners as well. Uh, like I say, we're just discussing things that you might want to adopt. You might want to adapt them for your use or you might want to discard them because it's not necessarily relevant to uh, your, um, your particular uh, relevant. Uh, we hope you've been able to take something away from this evening. As a reminder, if you'd like to revisit, there is a replay of the workshop. Uh, the links on that will be sent to you via email with a list of resources to support that. Um, once we finish tonight, a survey will pop up in your window. Please take the time to fill this in uh, as your feedback is, is genuinely really valuable to us. If you're wondering what's next, uh, keep an eye out for more details on our social media channels or through the CAA Skywise as well. Uh, we've got an exciting program of workshop ideas and uh, lots of people have emailed us, post the uh, workshops of ideas of things they'd like us to cover and consider as well, uh, which, was, uh, which was really interesting. Uh, sadly, we've run out of time for this evening. Uh, all that reminds me to say is a big thank you to Nigel for his support and advice. And Talif has been uh, firing away behind the scenes, tirelessly running the polls, keeping both Nigel and I on uh, on track uh, as ever. Uh, we'd like to thank you for engagement and participation throughout this, like I say. And uh, 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 like I say, we, we wish you all the best for getting back to flying. I don't know what Nigel thinks. Um, the start of this year has been... It's been a slog. It's been hard work. The weather's been rubbish. Airfields have been rubbish. Um, everybody's feeling the pinch with money. Um, everybody I speak to seems to have had big maintenance bills as well because aircraft have been sat damp and cold and things like that. So it feels like a bit of a slog getting going. So do take it, uh, take it easy, take it safely, and uh, more to the point, enjoy it when it comes to you when you get back uh, into the, the run of it. And let's all hope for. A, a nice calm spring and a good summer. Uh, Nigel, uh, thank you again. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing everybody, uh, hopefully, at our next webinar. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Okay, goodbye. Yeah.